before we go into the uh, individual three solutions Brian just mentioned, I thought a technology primer was in order. Uh, now, uh, at the same event six months ago, I went really dug deep in technology. This time, we're going to keep it a little bit high level and try to condense it to give time to discuss the pros and cons of the three other solutions here. So real quick, WDM can be summed up as you want to get more stuff out of a fiber. If you assign things to different colors, you're going to be able to squeeze more into that fiber. So when you hear about wavelengths, these are just different colors on a fiber. So when we talk about network latency, we need to understand what are these sources. And I don't mean which box or which vendor. What I'm talking about is it's not just the length of the fiber. Uh, odds are you're probably not near where that fiber comes out of the ground. Um, and as an example, the office I work at was uh, three miles from where their fiber came out of the ground. And it took quite a, quite a bit of effort to dig that and get that to our office. So proximity is one of those sources of delay. How close are you to that fiber that you want to get to? And that's why you see this uh, uh, um, surge in co-location facilities. Another source of network latency is fiber delay. So that's how long is the fiber? And it's not point A to point B. There's a lot of extra fiber there you don't know about um, as it wiggles all around and goes through plenums and, uh, and their service pools. So length of fiber. And then finally, uh, the part that ADVA controls the most, transport equipment delay. That's even if you had the optimal fiber, you were right there in a co-location facility, the equipment you choose can and does have an impact on the delay in your network, which is is what ADVA specializes in. So since this is what ADVA specializes in, I'm just going to briefly touch on the sources of the transport latency that comes from your equipment and your equipment provider. And, uh, and I've uh, listed the four major ones here. One is color conversion. So we mentioned WDM is carrying information on a color on a fiber. Well, you've got to get your information to a color. Turning into a color, uh, there's different ways of doing it. You can do it slow. You can do it fast. ADVA is very good at that. Amplification, as the light goes in the fiber, it gets weaker. Uh, amplifiers uh, make that optical signal stronger. Now, it turns out there's a lot of stuff in an amplifier. I won't go into the details, but there's uh, spools of fiber. There's things called slope compensators. All these things can slow down your signal. How you do an amp uh, matters, and again, ADVA's good at that. We build our own amps. Not many people in industry still do that. Dispersion compensation. This is the one usually talked about when, you, when a vendor comes and says, hey, I've got this low latency product offering. What they're talking about is removing these huge spools of dispersion compensating fiber. Um, that's pretty well understood by all vendors now. You, you put in a fiber rod grading instead. But um, there's things, there's ways of doing it that work better than others. We have a lot of experience with that. And finally, regeneration. If you go far enough, Amplifiers aren't going to cut it. You're going to have to regenerate it. There's different ways of regenerating, um, and we're good at that as well. So these are the sources of that transport latency. So if you looked at those sources and these proximity fiber delay transport, these are where the transport latencies come from. So that's the physical latencies. Now, there's also sources of network latency or protocol. You can think of it more of a theoretical or abstract latency. And these are sources of latency by network layer. Now this is the OSI protocol. This is sometimes called the seven layer stack. You can think of it as like an inverted wedding cake or a stackable uh, stacking boxes. But basically there's lots of sources of latency in all these different layers of network. And you know, this wasn't always the case. Back when the OSI network stack was invented, there were a lot of competing proposals. And actually the prevailing theory at that time was no, this could never be successful, having seven layers, seven different vendors, seven different ways of doing things. There were a lot of competing standards that were two or three layers. Well, here we are in the internet generation and uh, the seven layer stack is one. And each of these can add sources of latency. But what I'd like to point out here though is the idea of what you're transporting. And we talk about packets, people realize routers route packets. We talk about our data that our software uses. Well, each of these layers has its own information container or segment. So at the transport layer, you're talking bits, the ones and zeros. At the layer two, you're talking frames. At layer three, it's packets, people are familiar with that. Layer four, which most, uh, most data feeds and information in internet rides on the layer four, those are segments. Um, and then data. So it's not just about packet delay. Any of these things have their own delay metrics related to them. So uh, this is just, you know, I won't go into a lot of detail, but this is just to show that fact. So we always talk about packet delay, and the question I'm asked probably most often is, how long does it take to transmit a trade order? Stop talking latencies. How long does my trade order? Well, this is not an easy answer, but you could sum it up by 64 byte packets, probably the, the quickest you could have there. Now, what I've highlighted in yellow here is that. Uh, frame time, so uh, that would be your layer two uh, frame delay. And the reason that's highlighted is I'm noting that between one gig and 10 gig, you may be twice as fast, uh, 10 times faster bit time. Your packet may be 10 times 
quicker and shorter, but your frame time is only slightly faster at 10 gigs. So you have to understand these layers, what their time is, um, and, and that helps you choose what bandwidth, what uh, equipment, and what protocols you run. So, uh, so the key point of this in, in, in transport is that you have to walk, your application, all these algos and things of that nature, they reside all the way at the top of the stack, layer seven. You've got to walk down all these layers to go across to transport to the other side, and then you have to walk all the way back up there again. Obviously, you only want to do this on each end. If you've got routers all over your network, you're going up and down this at every router. If you've got a dedicated low latency transport network, you're only doing this on the ends. And when you hear about things called bridging protocols, what they're talking about is uh, kind of sneaky ways or tricky ways of having uh, a cut through or a bridge between these higher layers so that the applications don't have to punch down all those layers back again. So when you hear about things like RDMA and iWARP and all these um, funny acronyms, they're actually talking about not having to go through all those layers and let the software, the two ends, talk directly and share memory together. So uh, another question I'm often asked is what does the typical trading network look like? Well. A typical network today looks like this. It's a, what's called an IP GMPLS network, core network. Um, it's all routers, everything's IP. Um, it's those layers and stacks I've showed you. Most networks, data networks look like this today. Trading networks should not look like that. Trading networks look more like this. And this is actually kind of cool, so I'm gonna spend a minute on this. You've got exchanges, you've got <laughs> traders. And in a, sim in a simplistic world, the trader would just say, hey, read a feed and then give me this trade. Well, it turns out there's a lot that goes on uh, in this whole interaction. It's kind of like a feedback loop or a circle. It feeds on itself so that an exchange puts out its market feed, it has its market data, and from that goes probably the largest multicast networks in the world, taking a simple uh, data feed that may only be one gig or less of information and you're expanding it to over 10 terabytes of multicast data because everyone wants to know what the market data is. They all got to get it in the same information timestamp, same time. That's the world's largest multicast network. And then from that multicast, it gets distributed to whoever buys or subscribes to that. And then you've got the feed handler because when you got all this market data coming in to the trader, he has to somehow deal with all those market feeds. So that's the feed handler. From that, it's fed into algo engines. Um, a lot of you are familiar with that and work in that area. And then from that, a trade is computed or decided. A trade is made. That then feeds back to exchange gateway because at that exchange, they don't just put out market data. Where's that market data come from? It's telling you what's happening on the trades. So then the trades are all looked at. Um, the exchange gateway processes those trades. And even, so it's this continual loop, but even that's a simplistic view, because if you look at the exchange side, they have a massive corporate LAN, they have high performance computers doing all of this, they, they're required by law to keep records of everything that happens, they have uh, enormous complex storage area networks, and they need resiliency. If power goes out somewhere, it's expected the exchange keeps running. Same thing on the trader side. You've got corporate LAN, risk engines, dashboards, record keeping, uh, it's, it's very complex in addition to this whole cycle that's going on here. Um, and it, it actually gets more complicated than that in that here I've shown what the typical transport networks look like. Anything and everything you can imagine exists out there between people who take a copy of a, of a market feed and distribute it to others, uh, the dark pools, uh, the co-location facilities. It's basically a rat's nest and all of this latency uh, is important and in any of these cases you can you have lots of different options on how you connect these sites together so that's what we're going to look at today is how do we really tap into this how do I transport the data and so I've shown here this is a schematic of kind of what happens when you put data into a fiber and there's lots of different ways of getting your stuff squeezed into that glass fiber I'm um, starting from the left the simplest you could just uh, lease a port on existing switch router, that's layer three, layer four, and you better define a committed information rate. Uh, you can tap the fiber at the uh, transponder side. Now there's two different ways of thinking of this. You can be on the left side of that, what's called the gray side, and then you don't have to deal with all the optical parameters like power, budget, OSNR, things of that dispersion, things of that nature. Or you can do what's called leasing uh, alien wavelength, and the industry calls it an alien wavelength. Here again, you're still at the transponder side, but you're directly feeding 
the prism that combines all those colors together here. And then finally on the far right here, you can just lease the dark fiber yourself. And that doesn't mean it's necessarily just your fiber. There's a lot of consortiums in like the healthcare and the uh, research areas where they form these consortiums that share a lease dark fiber. But it's you own the glass, you better do everything yourself. So this chart doesn't change. This chart stays the same no matter which of these three options you go with. This is how fundamentally how data networks, uh, WDM transport networks are built. However, where the distinction occurs is who owns what, who is managing what, especially the SLA, who is guaranteeing what. Um, for instance, if you were to get a Lisa gray side wavelength here, you don't have to worry about the, the optical power, uh, channel balancing, OSNR, dispersion maps, slope compensation, things of that nature. You only have to worry about it here. If you were getting a port here, you don't have to worry about the network. You're guaranteed a certain layer three information rate and latency. Different people will own different parts of this puzzle, even though the slide inherently doesn't change. Um, it's just who owns what and then who is guaranteeing what and who's paying for what and committing to what.